Welcome to lesson three on limits titled asymptotes and in this lesson we're going to be looking at vertical and horizontal asymptotes and giving them definitions that are going to be grounded in calculus. What I'd like you to do first is go ahead and pause the video and see if you can recall definitions for these two concepts vertical and horizontal asymptotes and when you're ready restart the video to see if your definitions match up with what my definitions are. So for a vertical asymptote, what we're looking at is a line a function cannot cross as x approaches a given value. So in this case, something like this. Generally, we draw these as dotted lines to signify they're not actually part of our function. And our function might turn toward positive infinity to avoid it. It might turn toward negative infinity to avoid it. A horizontal asymptote is a line a function appears to approach as x approaches positive or negative infinity. Right over top of that, I want you to write down the phrase end behavior, because that's what a horizontal asymptote guides. Generally, we draw it as a horizontal dotted line, and a function may seem to level out as it approaches it. Big thing is, don't get the idea that a function cannot cross a horizontal asymptote. There are cases where it can. The whole idea is, the function appears to level off toward that value as we go out to the extremes, toward the ends. So true or false? If you have the function f of x as a rational function with a bunch of stuff in the numerator divided by x minus a, then there must be a vertical asymptote at x equals a. Well, we should recognize that substituting in x equals to a would cause a problem. We would have all that stuff divided by 0. And that usually is a sign for us that we have something going on. We have a value that's not part of the domain. Where we have two options. Is this a whole or is it a vertical asymptote? We've already looked at this idea of having holes in the graph previously, but let's remember how we get a vertical asymptote. And that is if we can factor out an x minus a from the numerator in this case and cancel that factor out with the denominator. This is what we call removable, and x equals a signifies a hole in the graph. But if we cannot factor and cancel, then x equals a becomes that vertical asymptote. So let's try this with an actual function instead of just putting blah in the numerator and dealing with x minus a. Use the function f of x equals x squared plus 2x minus 8 all over x squared plus x minus 12. And first we want to identify all vertical asymptotes. Well, in order to do that, the first thing we're going to do with any rational function when we're talking about behavior and dealing with asymptotes is factor the numerator and the denominator. Both nice quadratics, both should factor relatively easily. So in the numerator, we're going to end up with an x plus 4 times x minus 2. In the denominator, an x plus 4 times x minus 3. And notice, I have a removable factor, this x plus 4, which would tell me the x value that would make that equal to 0, x equals negative 4, that would be removable. That would be a hole in the graph. I'm not worried about those. I want to find vertical asymptotes, which I will using the second factor in the denominator that I cannot remove. The x value that would make that equal to 0 is x equals 3, and this line will be my vertical asymptote. So now that we know it's a vertical asymptote, it opens us up to two types of problems. And we can't deal with the two-sided limit for this. We've already talked about, for vertical asymptotes, that was a spot we said that the limit cannot exist. But I can still focus on the one-sided limits, because when we think about vertical asymptotes, we know that our function is going to be unbounded around these vertical lines. It's either going to go toward positive or negative infinity. So if I look at the limit as x approaches 3 from the left for f of x, I already know that's going to be equal to one of these two things not a real number, I'm just going to be able to describe which way the function's headed as I approach 3 from the left. But i got to make that decision. How do I do that? Well, I'm going to take the simplified version of my function, the x minus 2 divided by x minus 3 we had left over. And we're going to use a value close to 3 on the left side of it, something like 2.9. And what we'll get is... 2.9 minus 2 over 2.9 minus 3, which will be equal to a nice positive 0 0.9 over negative 0 0.1. Positive divided by negative tells me that I'm going to go toward a 
negative infinity. Let's see what's happening from the right side. Again, I'm going to evaluate this using the same simplified version and use an x value close to 3 on the right side, something like 3.1. And what we'll get is 1.1 divided by 0 0.1. Well, that's a positive divided by positive. That's going to go toward a positive infinity. Now let's look at horizontal asymptotes, those descriptions of n behavior. And what we think about when we think about horizontal asymptote is horizontal as asymptotes help us answer this question. What does the y value approach as the x value approaches negative infinity and positive infinity out toward my extremes? Does it approach a specific number or does it grow without bound? Well, here are our rules for horizontal asymptotes specifically as they relate to anything, any sort of rational function or anything written as a fraction. If the denominator of that fraction grows faster, it gets a higher value as you move out toward positive or negative infinity, and the numerator grows slower. So we got a not as big number over a really, really, really big number. Well, very small divided by very big is going to get us to equal zero, and our horizontal asymptote would be y equals zero. If the numerator and denominator appear to be growing equally fast, relatively equal, then what you're going to have is a big number divided by an equally big number. Well, we know from basic algebra those two would cancel out and be left with a 1. And if the numerator grows faster than the denominator, what you're going to end up with is a very big number divided by something that isn't very big, doesn't really matter too much, and we're going to end up with a plus or minus infinity. Well, let's make a decision on which one, just like we did with our vertical asymptotes, but we know it's going to be unbounded. So what I would like you to do is pause the video and notice the table right below this section. I would like you to try to fill that in before you move on to watch the rest of the video. What it's talking about is recognizing which functions grow faster as x values get larger and larger. So fill in all the function values that you see in the table, and when you're ready to, come back and check your answers against mine. So now that you've had a chance to do your own work, please check your answers against mine, and notice you might have tried to fill in the entire table uh, for certain things that got a little bit too big, like say this x to the 10th, I use scientific notation to avoid writing those numbers. And for these exponential functions, when I got to powers of 100 and powers of 1000, those numbers are just too big. And so all I should know is that since e is bigger than 2, 4 is bigger than e, I know that those three are going to go in this order. 2 to the x when I deal with something like x to 100 is going to be a really, really big number. e to the x is going to be even bigger. 4 to the x is going to be even bigger. And when I look at these seven functions I've listed, well, notice the natural log function is still going to grow unbounded, but that's going to be my slowest. And the ones that grow the fastest are my exponentials, starting with 4 to the x, e to the x, 2 to the x. And my power functions are all dependent on the exponent. x to the 10th is going to grow faster than x to the 3rd, which will grow faster than x squared. So being able to recognize functions and how quickly they grow as you move out toward infinity will help you when you deal with horizontal asymptotes. So let's try finding the horizontal asymptotes for these functions. And what we want to get into is using a specific notation. Dealing with finding the horizontal asymptote is going to deal with looking at the limit as x goes to infinity for this function. And what you want to recognize is the terms that grow fastest in both the numerator and denominator. As I go out toward infinity, this is actually just going to end up looking like x squared over 3x. That 4 and the negative 5 aren't even going to matter. Simplifying that one step further, what we're going to get is just x over 3. And what you can think to do in this case is plug in that infinity. It doesn't make much sense because it's not a number, but we can try it out. You're going to get a positive very big number divided by a very small number. We already talked about that's going to be unbounded. That's going to approach positive infinity. So what if I take the limit as x goes to negative infinity? For horizontal asymptotes, I need to check both positive and negative values. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump straight to the simplified version I had. And here I'm going to substitute in a negative infinity. Well, now I'm going to have a very negative number divided by a very small positive number. Negative divided by positive is a negative. This will be unbounded toward negative infinity. Looking on your next example, again, let's take our limit as x goes to positive infinity to start. So taking my biggest term from the numerator. I'll have x growing much faster than the 4 because the 4 is not going to grow. 
in the denominator, I'll have 3x growing faster. Well, this is going to simplify to just a 1 over 3. And limit of a constant, no matter where you go to, is going to be that constant. And for this problem, it's not even going to matter when I go to negative infinity, because again, if I take that simplified version, that's still going to be 1 third as well. And so I'll have a horizontal asymptote, y equals 1 third. And dealing with our last example here. So we're going to take our limit as x goes to infinity. And we are going to pick out the biggest term in the numerator and denominator. In this case, we're going to have an x up top, 3x squared in the denominator. And simplifying, we'll get the limit as x goes to infinity of 1 over 3x. And I cancel out an x, bring this exponent down to 1. Now, if I'm going to take 1 over 3 times some very large number, remember, very small over very big, is going to get you looking to 0. And just like in the last example, it's not even going to matter when I switch this to negative infinity. I'm going to get 1 over 3 times some very negative number. It's still 1 over a very large magnitude value. That's still going to equal 0. And so my horizontal asymptote, y equals 0. So let's end with some examples that are a little bit more specific types of problems, like a weird problem like this one here. y equals square root of x squared plus 2 all over x minus 1. Well, if I want to take the limit as this say goes to positive infinity, well, what I can still do is I can still isolate the biggest term in the numerator and denominator. And here, even though it's the square root of x squared, that's still going to grow much faster than a 2. And in the denominator, I'll just be focused on the x. Simplifying, I'll get limit as x goes to infinity of x over x, which we should realize is just going to be 1, my horizontal asymptote. Now looking on 7 and 8, they look like they are the same function. Again, let's go ahead and isolate the biggest term. So in that numerator, even though everything's under the square root, the only number that's really going to matter to us in there is going to be 4x squared. And in the denominator, I got a 3x. So simplifying this a little further, I will get 2x over 3x. And since the x's will cancel, this limit will just be 2 over 3. But here's where this one's going to get a little bit tricky. When I look to negative infinity, well, again, I'm going to start here. But the one thing you have to realize is that this term up top is always going to be positive because it's a positive square root. The difference in this problem is going to be when I look to negative infinity, I'm going to have a guaranteed positive 2x over 3x. Well, in this case, yeah, these are going to cancel, but what I'm going to be thinking about really is I'm going to end up with 2 times that infinity, but I know it has to be positive. Here, I'm going to have 3 times what is allowed to be a negative infinity. And so in this case, this is going to be a positive divided by negative, and it's going to be a negative 2 thirds. It's important to note that when I say I have a positive square root, you've got to realize that number always has to come out positive. You cannot get a negative number out of a square root, but I could get a negative number out of this denominator. Let's get a couple more that are a little bit more straightforward. So limit as x goes to infinity for negative 4 times e to the 1 over x. Here, I'm just going to go ahead and plug in that infinity. Because what I want you to think about is, as you go toward positive infinity, remember, you have 1 over a very big number. That is just going to be 0. And e to the 0 is going to be 1. And negative 4 times 1 will give us a limit of negative 4. So I have a horizontal asymptote, y equals negative 4. In this example over here, number 10, I'm going to go ahead and plug in that infinity. It's 5e to the negative x, so 5e to the negative infinity. Well, using your exponent properties, I can move this down to the denominator, use the reciprocal, and say that this is actually going to be 5 over e to the positive infinity. Now, e to the positive infinity, we should know, is going to be a very, very big number. That's going to be 5 over some absurdly large number. And remember, very small divided by very big is going to be 0. This will have a horizontal asymptote, y equals 0. Last one's to check out are some problems involving trig functions. So 11. 
the limit as x goes to negative infinity of sine of x over x. Again, why not just substitute this in right now? Now here's the one thing you're going to have to realize, is that sine of x always has a range between negative 1 and positive 1. No matter what, best worst case, however you want to say it, is that that's either going to be a positive or negative 1 or something in between divided by some very big number. You're going to have something relatively small divided by something very, very big. There is 0. And your horizontal asymptote is y equals 0. In the next example, again, let's go for just substituting in. So in this case, you're going to have negative 3 times cosine of 1 over infinity. Well, we have already seen a couple times now, 1 over infinity, that's going to be just about 0. And cosine of 0 is 1. Negative 3 times 1 is negative 3. And we have a horizontal asymptote of negative 3. Limit as x goes to infinity of sine of x. Well, here's a slightly tricky one. And the reason why it's tricky is sine of x continues to oscillate, continues to move back and forth between negative 1 and 1, which we talked about back in example 11. Let's say I end up at somewhere that I'm going to call infinity, where this thing is equal to 1. Well, if I go ahead and I just add on another, so I take the infinity and I add pi to it. Well, I should realize that that's going to put me back down to negative 1. And there's no way I can lock in where this function is going to end up as I go out to the extremes because it's going to keep moving back and forth. So this limit does not exist. And that's the idea of oscillation. If something's oscillating back and forth between values, it cannot lock in on a limit. Final example, limit as x goes to infinity for 5x. So we're going to say 5 times infinity times cosine of infinity. Well, I know this part right here, 5 times infinity, that's going to be some very large number. But cosine of infinity, think about what cosine looks like. Cosine is just sine shifted over. So if sine did not exist out of positive infinity, we got to kind of realize that by the same reasoning, cosine at infinity will not exist either. That limit will not exist. So something where the limit is infinity times something where the limit does not exist, the does not exist is going to win out, and this overall limit will not exist. All right, as I said in the previous lesson, please make sure you review your notes and summarize.